Good morning. Welcome to all of you uh, to ODI's event on Asia's economic prospects, as well as uh, those of you here in London. We have a number of online viewers watching from around the world. So hello to all of you. I look forward to receiving all of your questions uh, later on. So uh, a reminder, today's event will be recorded and a video will be available from the ODI website shortly thereafter. And while you're there, do check out some of the fantastic research reports um, that they've been doing as well. And please also follow along on Twitter, uh, hashtag Asia Economy. Uh, the handle for ODI is at ODI Dev. So I'm Linda Yu. Um, I am an economist at Oxford and London Business School. I've done a, a number of uh, books on uh, Asia as well as the global economy. And my current work is looking at um, Britain's economic diplomacy, which um, how it should think about doing policy, um, its trade and investment policy. So I'm very delighted to be here today to talk about, to moderate, or as I always say, I'm just the timekeeper for this event on um, Asia's economic prospects. Um, so we're looking to about 2025, um, and the prospects do appear to be strong. But as we all know, uh, the past is not a predictor of future success. And that's what we're going to explore uh, with this panel today both in terms of um, the factors um, that will help facilitate Asia's prospects, but also the challenges um, that these economies will face in the coming years. Um, not limited to protectionism, um, aging population, debt issues, um, but we're also going to look at um, how countries like Britain uh, could work to seize the opportunities and help these countries address vulnerabilities. And we'll also think about the economic implications of China's development strategies and any um, lessons that might hold for other countries as well. So I'm going to introduce uh, this terrific panel that I have here with me who's going to answer all of your questions in the next um, hour or so before we have a discussion. I'm going to introduce them each briefly, and then when they speak, I'll give them their, their proper introduction. So to my right is Ganesh uh, Vignaraja. She, he's the executive director of the Lakshman um, Kadura Gamar, I'm going to call it uh, LKI, Institute of International Relations and Strategic Studies in Sri Lanka. He's also a senior research associate here at the ODI. Um, remotely with us, I'm absolutely delighted to say that we're uh, joined by Dr. Indrajit Kumaras, Kumaraswamy, who's the governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Um, Wonderful to have you, Governor. He'll be participating remotely here with us. Uh, to my left is Rachel Turner. She's the Director of Economic Development at DFID. And to her left is Dirk Develt. He's the Principal Research Fellow and Head of the International Economic Development Group here at ODI. So actually, Dirk is the host. I really am just the timekeeper. <laughs> um, and so without further ado, um, we're going to hear first um, from Ganesh. Now, he, um, he has this incredible CV, so I'm not going to do him justice. I'm just going to give you a brief snapshot of it. Over the last 25 years, his experience has spanned the private sector, international organizations, and academia, both here in the UK and in Asia. He's held senior roles at the Asian Development Bank, um, at Maxwell Stamp PLC, where he was head of trade and competitiveness um, here in London. He's also worked for the OECD, the Commonwealth Secretariat, and Oxford University, where he obtained his um, degree. So he's recently co-authored an ODI report on development prospects and challenges for middle-income countries in Asia, Asia in 2025, and he's going to present the conclusions of the study to start off today's discussion. So, Ganesh. Thank you very much, Linda, and it's a real pleasure to be back at ODI to talk to you about this study, Asia in 2025, Development Prospects and Challenges for Middle-Income Countries, uh, that uh, Dirk, myself, Annalisa Prison, and Judith Tyson uh, wrote. Um, essentially, the study tried to look at the macro prospects for 46 developing Asian countries, as well as Japan, Australia and New Zealand, um, and we tried to take a period that's not so far away, 2025, uh, to see what kind of scenarios might unfold. 
we also tried to look at some of the things that we thought were defining features of the changing landscape to 2025. We looked at global value chains. We looked at the Belt and Road Initiative and the implications of that, particularly on the debt issue. And we looked at income poverty as well as inequality. Um, and the last thing we tried to get a sense of was what development partners might do to take a different view of uh, their strategies, particularly in Asia. Um, this study is available free on the internet, and you can download it from the ODI website. And if you don't want to read the whole report, you can look at the shorter summary, uh, what's called a policy brief. So you have that option. Um, let me try to give you some of the main conclusions uh, that would be of interest to you. The first kind of conclusion we come up with is that Asia, which is a global region, in the world economy will continue to rise um, in its share of global GDP. It will be something like a third of the world economy in 2025, um, and its rate of growth uh, will continue to be something like 5.5, 5 5.6, 5.7% in the next period. Uh, but the pace at which Asia is growing is slower than before. So that's the first conclusion that I'd like to give you. Um, now, along with that kind of rise of Asia, you have a number of bads uh, that also come about. Uh, the population of Asia uh, will uh, increasingly see aging, um, which is one uh, factor. Another one is that uh, trade will play less of a role in economic growth uh, than before. And remember, this was a region that grew very much based on trade uh, and open markets. And, and so this is a big change in the way that it's going. And then you have glaring differences in income inequality between countries and within countries. And that will be a major feature of this region. Um, in terms of income uh, per head, this region mostly becomes middle income, which is a big change. Only Afghanistan and Nepal uh, will remain poor countries. And that's a very uh, clear feature. But these middle income countries have all those challenges uh, that I just mentioned. A second uh, important issue uh, that I'll tell you about is about uh, global value chains, this very decentralized um, set of production globally uh, that centered around China um, is also changing and with China's slowdown that, that we are seeing. And that presents both opportunities for latecomers as well as some risks that they've got to counter. Um, and the policy conclusion is that these latecomers really need to change their business environment to try to attract the kind of foreign investment that is leaving China to come to other countries uh, by keeping trade and investment regimes open, by having efficient tax systems, by investing in electricity costs, uh, as well as things like customs procedures. These are really important things uh, that they need to do if they want to attract this kind of investment. Third. The Belt and Road Initiative is obviously in the news because this forum in Beijing just concluded um, a, a day or two ago. Um, and it is a major game changer in Asia. Um, it can help, uh, to some extent, plug the infrastructure finance gap of Asia, which is estimated at some th $1 trillion uh, by different institutions. Um, this initiative will provide um, something like uh, 340 billion globally upwards, and, and the estimates vary a lot. Um, so it'll be a part of the story, not all of it, but there are lots of risks associated. The debt issue is one. Um, some people say that China is um, aggressively marketing itself and its capacity to build infrastructure and taking, getting developing countries to adopt these loans at floating interest rates, which then leads to the debt problem. Another issue concerns environmental uh, problems. Uh, in uh, some countries, there are um, you know, coastal erosion issues. There are uh, changing of the, birds, uh, the fly paths of birds across airports. Uh, there are power plants that spew out lots of coal and pollution. So there are these issues as well which are there. And then there are governance initiatives that people worry about uh, as well um, in terms of corruption and rent-seeking behavior, which is exacerbated by white elephant projects. So efficient management is needed uh, in order for the Belt and Road Initiative uh, to be uh, important in this region. Um, the fourth kind of important conclusion is that poverty has fallen to historic lows um, across Asia, 
Uh, but income inequality is a major problem um, within countries, and there are big gaps uh, across countries. Um, as I said, Afghanistan and Nepal are the only two low-income countries, but there are a whole range of other countries, particularly in South Asia, that are at risk of income shocks or falling back into poverty. Um, in India, for instance, if you take a $1.90 um, poverty line, some 20% of the population uh, remains poor. Uh, so that's a good interesting example of poverty. And India has a Gini coefficient of 0.51, which means that income inequality is very high. Um, so, so we have these issues uh, in South Asia, but across other countries as well. And we have to think of a range of issues around safety nets, uh, microfinance, special emphasis on educating the girl child. I think these become very important initiatives if we're trying to reduce this kind of income inequality and provide genuine opportunity uh, for a range of people. Um, we also did something called a vulnerability index, where we tried to take all the major findings from this report and put it together in a number, uh, purely to give you some sort of ranking as to which countries are at risk um, on some sort of scale. And we come up with three countries that are um, particularly vulnerable um, in, in this scenario. And I'll show you a slide on it in a minute. There are 18 countries that are vulnerable, and then the rest are robust. But these are all very risky um, uh, you know, in, in different terms. And so Asia really um, is a multifarious, multi-speed region growing at different rates of growth. And that, I think, is, is a very interesting issue with a range of uh, challenges that it faces. Um, the last conclusion is that um, development partners uh, should not move completely away from an aid approach uh, to no aid at all, uh, given that this is seen as a middle-income region. And we need to have variegated strategies. And I think Dirk Willem will talk a lot about that um, uh, as, we, as we go down the line. Let me just very briefly show you a few pictures, and you can see these in your report. Um, the first is, is one about the growth story. And you have a table there that gives you the rates of growth. And I guess the number for Asia that we sort of look at, um, and this was last year, is something like uh, under 6% is what Asia's growth. And this is slower than before. Um, and you notice the really important factor in that is China's slow down to 5.5%, um, 6% is the kind of number we may see. India has the opposite trend uh, that you see growing very fast uh, through the Modi reforms. Um, Indonesia and others are growing at 5%, uh, uh, and you have Japan and so on, which are also slowing down. Um, so so the, the story there really um, is one of a, a reduced kind of new normal kind of story, but Asia still remains very important in terms of its share of the world economy, and China remains the most important country in terms of its global share. Um, India is only about 4%. Um, Bangladesh and Indonesia and so on are much smaller players, although with large populations. Um, so this is kind of a story you get on the growth side. Um, in terms of trade, um, on a per capita basis, many Asian countries are quite trade-oriented. Um, but the worrying thing is the way in which trade plays a role in economic growth. And there was a kind of a magical number of two that people used to talk about. So um, trade grew twice as fast as GDP growth in the sort of heyday of globalization when trade barriers were reduced and technological change um, was very pervasive. Um, but this number comes down to less than one, and that's a really worrying number uh, to look at. And, and, and so there's a story really about domestic demand and regional demand, which are increasingly important in Asia's growth. And regional integration in Asia is one of the big agenda items um, there. I mean, it's not only just trade integration, but also building the right kind of institutions to deal with common goods like water, environment, uh, as well as bad, such as crime, um, as well as things like money laundering and issues of that kind, which are, are very important. Um, the, 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 tr the story about this trade slowing down is partly linked to rising uh, global protectionism. Um, we have a, a big trade dispute between the United States and um, China at the moment. Um, as well as uh, changing consumption patterns uh, across Asia affected by population aging, which is another very important factor. Uh, technological change is yet another important area with uh, artificial intelligence and robotics uh, galloping away, and this confluence of the so-called fourth industrial revolution technologies um, 
is, is coming to the fore and that will have huge employment implications as well as other implications. Um, now, in the trade illustrious story, there are a few kind of bright spots. There are countries like Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh that are seeing a slight improvement in the trade elasticity, and that's linked to economic reforms uh, that are happening in those countries, um, as well as uh, higher um, per capita incomes that encourage a certain pattern of consumption. Um, in terms of income per head, uh, you have the fact that most of Asia will be middle income in the period ahead, and indeed many countries will be high income. And there are two definitions of income on that chart. Um, and, and you have um, not shown there Singapore, which will be the richest country in Asia. Um, and Japan will, of course, remain rich. And then Korea um, is another amazing performance. It's probably the only country in Asia that graduated from kind of low income to middle income to high income on a very systematic basis and uh, has a very impressive approach there. Um, but what's not uh, so evident to us is that there will be large pockets of, of disparities between countries. So you have India uh, there, which you know, has only a per capita income of $3,200 in 2025 in current dollar terms, uh, Bangladesh, which is $2,500, uh, and so on. So, so these, these largish countries will have uh, low per capita income. Interestingly, Sri Lanka uh, has a per capita income of $5,000. It's the highest in South Asia after Bhutan. Um, and and um, uh, it, 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 will, it will continue to do uh, reasonably well. The fourth conclusion is about uh, value chains. Now, remember, these are the um, geographic spread of production activities um, in different regions. And, and China has become like the assembly hub of this type of trade uh, with uh, parts and components uh, being made in different bits of Asia, in Japan, in uh, Taipei, China, or Taiwan, uh, in Southeast Asian countries, uh, and it all flows through parts and components trade uh, to China. Um, so the iPhone is the famous example of this type of trade. Um, now, this type of uh, trade is slowing uh, because of China's slowdown, and Chinese outward investment, which is what the chart shows you, is a very crude indicator of where this is going um, in the future. And you can see uh, in the green line that three or four countries, particularly the slightly larger ones, India and Indonesia, are getting quite a bit of this type of outward investment. And this is not just Chinese firms. It's also European and American and British companies, indeed, that are moving out of China because of rising wage costs and slower growth, and, of course, the trade war um, uh, with the United States uh, that, that is continuing. Um, there is a labor-intensive bit of this, and then there is a capital-intensive bit of this value chain. Um, and, and part of it is this... Um, labor-intensive part that is uh, chasing wages, but the capital-intensive part is also having um, greater uh, internal um, orientation within China as they're trying to build a supply network based on R&D. So there's a second value chain uh, which is centered on China. Now, latecomers, of course, are going to have to improve their business environment, uh, particularly to reduce their trade costs and, and get more open markets for trade and investment and deal with a whole bunch of issues behind the border Tax administration is one big issue that people worry about. Uh, the cost of electricity uh, supply is another one, as well as legal systems are, are a third issue. Um, the Belt and Road Initiative um, is obviously this kind of game changer given the large infrastructure finance gap. And what this chart shows you is a potential risk, which is the so-called debt trap uh, diplomacy that people talk a lot about. Um, and what you notice is the bits in red that shows that it's not a uniform problem, but some countries are more vulnerable to this than others. And uh, Kyrgyz Republic is one that has some of that red. Uh, Mongolia is another. Uh, Tajikistan is a, a third. Uh, Laos uh, PDR is another. Uh, the Maldives is another. And the Maldives is interesting. Um, the Sinamale Bridge uh, is the case I think about, which is this bridge that connects the main island of Mali with the airport island, and it was built at a cost of $200 million. Half of it was granted from China, half of it was on loan terms. And President Nasheed was recently in Sri Lanka, and I was privileged to meet him. Um, and he said that um, we asked for a four-lane highway, and we got two lanes. What happened to the rest of the money? And the Maldives is launching an investigation through the new government to try to get a better sense of um, what the costs and benefits are of uh, this particular project as well as all Chinese investment and are trying to come up with some sort of renegotiation story with China. So infrastructure master planning becomes a critical policy ingredient along with uh, capacity building and debt sustainability if countries want to engage in this. Um, 
coming to the last bit, the vulnerability index is here, and you can see the range of countries in red, and you have Tajikistan, you have Afghanistan, and you have Laos, uh, which are in the red category. There's a whole bunch of countries ranging from India uh, right through to uh, Bhutan and Cambodia and Mongolia, uh, which are in the amber grouping. And we essentially tried to put together um, all the numbers in our report into some sort of composite number. Um, and this shows you that while Asia is doing well and will become greatly uh, middle income, there are countries that are still vulnerable and, and, and have poverty and income shocks, um, as well as other issues. Aging is there, and there are special geographical circumstances. There are, special, there are island states, which are uh, an issue. There are landlocked countries like Laos. Uh, there are post-conflict uh, economies, Afghanistan, for instance. Tajikistan is another. So we make this argument that development partners should really adopt a variegated approach uh, to Asia's development. Um, finally, uh, you have the various conclusions. Um, so Asia is going to continue to rise, but at a slower pace. Um, it will be a very important region in the world. Uh, these value chains offer these opportunities, uh, as well as have some risks. Um, and the BRI is a game changer, but handle it with care. Uh, you've got to get your domestic policies in order if you want to deal with this initiative. Um, because it has this debt trap as well as some environmental issues. And while poverty has fallen, income inequality is terribly an issue. Um, and many countries remain uh, vulnerable, which then makes a case for age. So thank you very much, Linda. Thank you, Ganesh. That was fantastic. Um, well, I think one thing is clear. We must all go and read this report <laughs> on the ODI website. I mean, what an extraordinary set of findings. And absolutely fascinating that Asia by 2025 is going to be one third of global GDP. Um, that would make it actually more important than the United States at the moment in terms of uh, global growth. And this is the, this is the, uh, the finding that really struck me, which is all the countries there except for Nepal and Afghanistan will be middle income. I mean, the consumption possibilities there. And I think all of that fits into this larger narrative of the countries becoming middle income. Therefore, their growth rates naturally slow because we expect countries which are richer to grow more slowly than countries which are poor, which are in the catch-up phase. So in other words, if um, Britain were to grow at 4%, that is all we will be talking about. <laughs> but if China were to grow at 4%, we'd all be thinking, oh dear. And so we should expect the slowing trajectory, but all of the issues that could um, affect this growth trajectory, including poverty shocks, including protectionism, including uh, debt, I think are extremely well laid out and certainly gives us a lot of food for thought. So while you're pondering that and thinking about your questions, um, I'm now delighted to introduce our next speaker. We're really privileged to have via video link um, Dr. Intrajit Kumaraswamy. He's the governor, as I said, of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. He's had 30 ex years of experience in policy making and providing economic services in terms of both macroeconomic and structural issues at the national and intergovernmental levels. The governor is going to discuss the prospects for Sri Lanka's economy. We heard from Ganesh's um, uh, presentation. It's going to have the second highest income um, in South Asia uh, by 2025. And he's going to outline how the risks and opportunities um, that have been outlined could play out in Sri Lanka. So, Governor, thank you very much for joining us, and the floor is yours, or the video link floor is yours. There's <laughs> Please. Thank you very much, Linda, and it's a great pleasure to be with you and to be part of such an eminent panel. Uh, what I'm going to do is really to pick up some of the themes in uh, Ganeshan's extremely insightful and clear presentation, and to look at them from the prism of the Sri Lankan perspective. So if I take a few of the areas where actually Sri Lanka is a little bit of an outlier in terms particularly of the South Asian region. Uh, interestingly, of course, though Asia is slowing down, uh, the region still accounts for 60% of global growth with uh, China accounting for 30 and India 15. So, it, uh, you know, in terms of being the growth driver in the world economy, despite the slowing down, that, uh, that, that situation hasn't changed. So what are some of the themes? One, in terms of demographics, unlike the rest of uh, South Asia, Sri Lanka is on the cusp of aging. Um, one opportunity though still exists in the sense that the opportunity to drive growth through augmenting uh, labor still exists because female labor force participation is extremely low at 34%. Female enrollment in the formal education system is extremely high 
but we have not been very successful in retaining, uh, uh, in encouraging women to enter and remain in the labor force. So that is something actually the government is now addressing, and the recent budget has introduced certain measures to to in, encourage uh, 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 female labor force participation. So though we are on the cusp of aging, there is this possibility for labor, labor augmentation uh, to continue through, uh, uh, through uh, a female, increased female labor force participation. Um, on inequality, the Guinea coefficient has been pretty stable in Sri Lanka. Uh, in 2003-04, it was 0 0.46, and in 2016, it was 0 0.45. So by and large, I mean, I know the Asian Development Outlook, the ADB's flagship publication a few years ago, identified rising inequality as arguably the most, most significant threat to the 21st century not becoming the Asian century. Uh, so it's a problem in the region, but in Sri Lanka so far, so far, uh, we don't see any significant uh, increase in inequality. And in fact, in terms of the regional balance of growth, we have seen more balanced growth with the western province, the region of, around the, uh, the capital, Colombo, which used to account for about 50 percent of GDP, now accounts for less than 40 percent. So there is, there is a, a, a better regional balance and we don't see any significant increase uh, in the Guinea coefficient. Um, now, despite that, you know, on where Sri Lanka has, um, I mean, I, 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 I should say, in conjunction with that, um, where Sri Lanka has done well is, is in terms of social development. Uh, in terms of Sri Lanka's ranking on the Human Development Index, in terms of Sri Lanka's performance in relation to Millennium Development Goals, the country has been an outperformer. Um, but we have not been as successful uh, in terms of uh, growth uh, and wealth creation. And there's complex causality for this. I mean, there are economic, social, and political factors. But one would argue, and you would expect this from the central bank, I guess, a major causal factor has been macroeconomic stress over several decades. And, and the, the main source of instability in the system has been the government's fiscal operations. And Sri Lanka is in many ways a typical twin deficit country. We have an unsustainable budget deficit, or we have had over the years and a uh, deficit in the current account of the balance of payments. So let me now, uh, in terms of looking forward to 2025, uh, try and share with you some of the things that are being done uh, to ensure that Sri Lanka gets out of this 2025, gets out of this twin deficit uh, basket uh, and gets on to a higher trajectory of growth and development uh, on the path to 2025. Um, on the macro side, there are four clear frameworks that are being put in place. One, uh, as I said, the main source of instability is the fiscal operations, and there, there is a framework for revenue enhancement based fiscal consolidation that is being put in place, and it has been supported by a new Indian Revenue Act, uh, elimination of, of uh, exemptions on the VAT, uh, infusion of technology for tax administration, uh, so some really tough things uh, that have been done, uh, including a formula for the fuel price uh, and another formula for the electricity price is also in the pipeline. So there have been some tough fiscal measures that have been taken. And uh, only for the second time in uh, 55 years, uh, the budget had a primary surplus last year. And going forward, we anticipate having a primary surplus, which we hope will then help us to also tackle uh, the challenging debt dynamics that the country has. Uh, that's one framework. A second framework relates to the central bank itself. The central bank has made significant progress in transitioning to a flexible inflation targeting framework. And to support that, the foundational law of the central bank, the monetary, they're going to have a new monetary law. So the monetary law Act that we've had since 1950, um, we, it is being enhanced uh, and a new law is going to be put in place. And the twin pillars uh, underpinning this new law are going to be autonomy and accountability. Uh, and in keeping with a flexible inflation targeting regime, we will manage the exchange rate flexibly. In the past, we've tended to have a bit of a dirty float, uh, but now we will manage the exchange rate flexibly because in an inflation targeting regime, as you know, the inflation has to be the first line of defense uh, in terms of uh, absorbing or adjusting to exogenous shocks. And we will 
manage the exchange rate flexibly and only intervene if we see uh, disorderly adjustment of the exchange rate, which is not in keeping with the underlying macroeconomic fundamental. And the fourth framework relates to liability management. Sri Lanka has a challenging uh, 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 debt uh, uh, profile. Uh, the, the dynamics are challenging, uh, but we are confident that we're getting on top of it. The government has passed the Liability Management Act, which now enables the government and the central bank to raise money over and above what is required to fund the government's public sector borrowing requirements, i.e. one can mobilize money purely for funding a liability management. So one can bring into place all the new techniques of liability management, and this, is, this will give us the capacity to significantly reduce the refinancing risks, the rollover risks. Uh, and uh, so those are the frameworks uh, that are being put in place. And as you would know, that not only are we uh, 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 putting in place these frameworks, but we are institutionalizing uh, through uh, enactments of law. On the growth framework, there is work being done on the factor markets, the business climate, investment promotion, trade policy facilitation, et cetera. I'd be happy to expand on this during the discussion. Um, um, progress is being made. It's not fast enough, but the direction of travel is, 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 is uh, positive. And that's evidenced by the fact that both in 2017 and 2018, we have had in absolute term record levels of FDI and exports, albeit from low bases. So the direction of travel uh, is, uh, is, is positive. Finally, on supply chains and BRI, Sri Lanka has not been able to penetrate uh, the global value chains. Uh, there are a number of reasons for this, uh, the most significant being the anti-export bias that we have tended to have in our overall policy matrix. Uh, the exchange rate, uh, high effective protection with power tariffs, etc., has meant that we have not been, been able to break into this game. Of course, intra-firm trade in Asia has been the most dynamic component of the international trading system for many years now, but we have not been able to access that. Uh, for, as I said, because our policy framework mitigated against it. Now, those things are now being addressed. The exchange rate is being managed more flexibly. Para tariffs have been gradually eliminated. On top of that, uh, there are other developments taking place. Uh, Ganeshan talk, talked about the relocation of Chinese uh, industry. And here we feel with China's involvement with the Hamantha report and the industrial zone that's going to be developed around it, that we have prospects of breaking into those supply chains through that development. In addition, what is happening in India could well bring about more propitious circumstances for replicating what happened in East and Southeast Asia when first, China, first Japan and then China rose. Because in the past, uh, Indian industrial development has been sluggish and it has been very kind of inward looking. Now the Make in India strategy on the one hand the GST, the, 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 the tax which was sold as, as one tax, one market, one nation, which has created a, a single market in India, makes it now easier for countries in the region to be able to, to trade with India. Uh, and most of all, in the past, though there was proximity, say, between Sri Lanka and India, distance was created by poor infrastructure in both countries. Transaction costs were high. But with infrastructure increasing in both countries now, the prospects of Sri Lanka being able to access Indian supply chains, particularly if the Make in India strategy uh, gains traction, uh, would create uh, other opportunities for uh, Sri Lanka to break into new value chains. So that's really uh, pretty much what I wanted to say. Uh, no, sorry, on the BRI, finally. Let me say on the BRI. Now, first thing to say is uh, there has been a narrative that has developed, which has made the... Uh, Sri Lanka, a poster child for uh, the debt trap, the Chinese debt trap. I must say that is not borne out by the facts. The Chinese debt in our overall portfolio is barely 10%. And except for one loan, all the others are, uh, are on very concessional terms. Now, there has been an issue in terms of the quality of a couple of the projects. That has to be conceded. But really, that is up to us to make sure, as Ganeshan pointed out, that there is proper screening and evaluation of the projects, and that is what will happen going forward. Uh, and we also see China pivoting from lending to 
equity in Sri Lanka. A number of the recent projects, large projects, have involved China, uh, Chinese companies, SOEs albeit, but Chinese companies are, are taking equity. Uh, so really, uh, given Sri Lanka's location, we are extremely well placed to take advantage of particularly the maritime circuit. Uh, and given that, uh, you know, there, is a very, there are very strong grounds for a very robust uh, commercial relationship between Sri Lanka and China. And Sri Lanka have excellent international relations with everybody. We certainly have excellent uh, relations with all the countries, all the major countries, which have a strategic uh, interest in the uh, Indian Ocean area, whether, whether it is uh, Australia, China, India, Japan, USA, all these countries are good friends of Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka has a neutral, a uh, non-aligned policy. It, there is no debt trap that we can see, uh, but we do see a great opportunity in terms of being able to access Chinese investment as part of the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. So with that, let me thank you very much for giving me this opportunity uh, to share some thoughts with you. Governor, that was exceptional, really fascinating um, assessment. Just one quick follow-up in terms of um, uh, so one of the issues around the Belt and Road that gets a lot of attention is this um, the Sri Lankan port um, that <laughs> has um, become part of the, the deal with China. If you could just quickly say a word on that, that I think that will help uh, us understand the issue. Okay. Uh, before I get to that, I should have made one other point. You know, it's interesting, and this, I think, came out in uh, President Xi's address to the recent BRI summit. The Chinese themselves are now infusing a debt sustainability framework to their investments as part of BRI and as environmental sustainability framework. These were two concerns, as uh, Ganeshan pointed out. But China, uh, you know, is, is dry, from their end driving uh, debt sustainability and an environmental sustainability. Now, this port is on the southern tip of Sri Lanka and is located very close to the major uh, uh, shipping zone. Uh, and uh, it was financed by, by loans, by a couple of loans from China. Um, and without the hinterland, it's in a rather remote area of the country. So for the port to become viable, the hinterland needs to be developed. Uh, and it is one of the lagging regions in the country. Uh, and so um, the government decided uh, to negotiate with the Chinese to convert the loan into a long lease. And there's now a joint venture company with majority Chinese holding, uh, which is going to run the port. Uh, um, uh, but the surrounding area will be developed by the Chinese into an industrial zone, which will significantly increase the commercial viability of the port and also um, meet our urgent requirement to increase our export, to, uh, to improve our export performance. So really in terms of uh, Sri Lanka's own objectives, uh, it was very much uh, a win-win uh, option to convert this loan into a long lease and then to get Chinese investment into, into that area, into a lagging region of the country. Thank you, Governor. Um, We'll, we'll come back to you in the discussion, um, but for now, thank you very much indeed. That was, as I said, exceptional, um, such a succinct um, presentation of these issues in Sri Lanka. And I, for one, am feeling very optimistic, actually. <laughs> so thank you. Now let me turn to my left, uh, Rachel Turner. Um, she, again, is the Director of Economic Development at the UK Department for International Development. She's going to discuss how the UK views Asia's growth prospects and the ways in which Britain can respond to opportunities and vulnerabilities in Asia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, I think uh, my starting point is, uh, I think, really the, the challenge that uh, Ganeshan set out, which is uh, the role for donors in balancing their effort across such a spectrum uh, of countries at different stages of development and different stages on this growth trajectory that Ganeshan set out. And certainly from the UK, 
point of view, how we see this is supporting countries along that transition. And as they get richer and better off, the case for traditional financial aid certainly declines. Um, but what absolutely doesn't decline is our commitment to provide technical and policy partnerships to support countries on that, uh, on that transition, on that journey, if you like. And also to think about more innovative ways to support investment and the right kind of investment uh, and support to mobilize uh, quality investment into countries. But just, uh, Linda, I was just going to say a few uh, points about some other trajectories uh, in addition to the ones that Ganeshan had been speaking about. Um, I think the first is just to understand what we think is going to be happening to um, extreme poverty. Uh, and we saw the we saw the forecasts of GDP per capita, uh, and it's you know it, it looks as if one dollar ninety a day, the definition of extreme uh, poverty, will show some fairly rapid decline um, over the next um, couple of decades, um, but nevertheless won't be fully eradicated. I mean, there will be pockets of extreme poverty, um, you know, in the conflict areas, in borderlands, uh, in in landlocked uh, areas. Um, so within countries, uh, there will still be pockets of real extreme poverty uh, in Asia, stubborn pockets of extreme poverty. And I guess uh, likely that inequality will rise both within and between countries. And I think one of the things that's important for us in thinking about our strategy is the likely um, pattern of migration flows that will then respond to inequality um, between countries uh, and managing those migration flows is likely to be an important part of our strategy in terms of helping governments to, to manage those, uh, those labor market flows. And of course, linked to that, social exclusion uh, issues will be key. And I think we know that modern slavery, for example, remains um, still very prevalent in Asia and will likely continue to be a very important part of our strategy. I think the other thing, even as you know, we we will see one dollar ninety a day poverty decline. But what's happening around the kind of three dollar a day poverty mark? And uh, our chief economist has, has has looked at that, and and estimates suggest that we're still going to see maybe a billion Asians around three dollar a day. Um, poverty over the next decade, um, but with large numbers clustered around the poverty line. Um, and, and I think that's important because what that means for us in DFID as we think about our strategy in Asia is that the, the, the pattern uh, of, of growth is really, really important around what's happening around that kind of $3 a day, but also the fact that poverty will then, of course, still be very susceptible to shocks. Um, so shocks uh, and inclusion. Uh, just a couple of words on other trends that um, are really driving uh, how we're thinking about our interaction and our strategy. I mean, of course, the urbanization piece is very well uh, spoken about and set out, but I think the, um, the, the, the resilience and the vulnerability of cities and the urban population is absolutely key and thinking about um, how we engage better in helping cities, particularly coastal cities, uh, plan for and manage the shocks uh, that they will face. And I think um, just a couple of words on that. So uh, what we see is that 80% of major cities in South Asia are expected to be exposed to a significant flood risk. Um, and that by 2050, we estimate that nearly 300 million South Asians will be living in cities prone to cyclones. And that, uh, that, that risk, that vulnerability, particularly drives us towards thinking about how we can really help those cities underwrite that um, that, that risk, uh, I looked up a statistic that said Lloyds of London think that about nearly one and a half trillion of GDP in, um, in Asia is uh, at risk of natural disasters, according to Lloyds of London. So I think that gives you a sense of, of that vulnerability. So um, two more points on the, the trends that are important for us in thinking about strategy. Um, one is the growing uh, 
the, the growing illicit economies, and Ganesh also spoke about that. But I think looking at uh, what we're seeing in terms of illicit flows, in terms of human trafficking, in terms of drugs, uh, counterfeit medicine, uh, and the rise of organized crime, and these are very important and are leading us to really step up working across partnership uh, with other parts of, uh, of the UK government, our work on um, on illicit economies and particularly illicit financial flows. And I know that's something that, uh, that my Secretary of State has spoken about a lot as important to us. And then just finally, on regional integration, and again, Ganeshan spoke about this, but uh, the opportunities from stronger regional institutions and stronger regional integration uh, uh, seem particularly important, whether that be regional trade, regional capital market integration, or the regional institutions for managing water and power. Um, and I think we can expect to see DFID's strategy of partnership with uh, regional institutions gaining uh, importance in the next period. So I hope you can sense from those, uh, those points about key trends that are important for us the kind of evolution that, uh, that DFID's strategy uh, in Asia is likely to take. So I, you know, I think you uh, will continue to see us with a very diversified strategy by income type, still focusing uh, with the very poorest on alleviating extreme poverty, um, but working harder to look at how we're integrating uh, patterns of growth to bring the poorest uh, into growth uh, opportunities. Uh, we use this word building markets, and building markets uh, is a word that's very important for the UK government as we think about the opportunities for the UK as well in, in, uh, in, in Asia, in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, but we're very clear that our approach to building markets isn't just a kind of top-down regulatory loosening approach, if you like, but also fundamentally building markets from the bottom up that involve the poorest, that involve women, that create stable and inclusive uh, societies and stable and inclusive patterns of growth. Uh, uh, and that will be you know, particularly important to us as we go forward. So I think um, some key points from me then on uh, the the things that will matter to us in our future strategy in Asia, some of the challenges. None of this is easy. I think getting the balance right in terms of resource and effort allocation between different countries in Asia is something that we're always going to welcome advice on and welcome continued engagement um, with people like ODI and the people in this room. I think getting the, uh, getting the, the resource pattern right and the effort right um, a, across the wide spectrum um, of, of Asian economies is something that's going to be super important for us and uh, very much welcome ODI's uh, challenge in the paper in, in giving us a steer on that. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. That was, that was actually wonderful. Um, it's lovely to hear the, um, the strategy Britain is um, thinking about in these areas. So I think um, it's not in this region increasingly going to be about just poverty mm -hmm. and aid, mm -hmm. but this, I think, um, extremely, I have to say, well, very well thought out mm -hmm. ways in which you can help underwrite risk, regional cooperation, mm -hmm. institutions, illicit flows. I think all of that is such a nice fine-tuned way of thinking about ways of dealing with a region that's going to become middle income. And then your point about $3 a day poverty, I think, is a really important one. We tend to talk about eradicating mm -hmm. extreme poverty as if we finished solving the poverty problem. But we all know if you make $1.91 per day, you're still poor. Um, and so we mustn't think that the issue is resolved, but rather it is this uh, variegated strategy um, of development and support that's so important. And um, yeah, and personally, I'm absolutely delighted because I know Britain has this fantastic commitment uh, to development, and we have heard it here this morning. Um, so then finally, uh, before we turn it open to all of you for questions, we're going to hear from Dirk William Develt, who, as I say, is really the host because he's the, uh, he invited me, he's the uh, principal research fellow and head of the International Economic Development Group here at ODI. He's going to reflect on what the panelists have said. Dirk will discuss opportunities for development cooperation in low and middle income countries, including in the areas of aid, trade, and investment. Dirk. Yeah, well, thank you very much, um, uh, Linda, and uh, thank you also to the, to the panelists. I think we've um, heard a range of uh, important um, issues already. Uh, so we've heard about major challenges and, and opportunities in, uh, uh, for, for, uh, for growth in, um, 
in, uh, in Asian countries. And, um, and it's important to realize that different countries are have very different trajectories and um, are different points of, uh, of development. Uh, that is the case in Africa, and that's also the case in, in Asia. Uh, but it's important to just uh, to, to re-emphasize that it's not all about Africa is poor, Asia is rich. It's, uh, it's a very diversified uh, set of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of countries. And, uh, and I think that is also um, uh, has its implications. So, uh, so in terms of challenges, we heard a range of economic challenges and a range of environmental challenges, a range of demographic challenges out there. Um, and so there are issues around um, uh, fragility, about conflict in, in Afghanistan is likely to remain. Uh, that's likely to remain a, sort of a key, important to have a, uh, an approach, also including by, by donors to, that need to be conflict sensitive. Um, but there are a range of other uh, challenges out there. So there's going from low-income country to middle-income country status, and some research by, um, uh, by uh, ODI, Andalisa Prison in particular, has highlighted, um, and we've done it in the past as well, some, some, some charts. If you look at, at if countries, and when countries go to middle-income country status, they perhaps sometimes lose a bit of uh, external finance options um, uh, or external finance flows, and there might be a dip, and that needs to be, um, to be addressed in terms of uh, external finance flows. Um, some other issues that perhaps we haven't mentioned as much, but trade preference erosion uh, or trade preference uh, graduation is an important issue for some of the, the Asian countries. So Bangladesh, uh, uh, Laos, Nepal, uh, Burma, they're all facing uh, trade preference uh, graduation. Um, so they become uh, they will graduate out of the LDC status or likely to in the, within the, in the decade. So there are different points in time for different countries and different tests uh, need to be uh, applied and it's not all sure whether it will happen and, and also even when it happens there might still be some, some tra transition uh, period but at some point it's going to happen and that some of the Asian countries like Bangladesh uh, and Cambodia that, that, that were dependent on, uh, on, on uh, trade preferences for their garments exports um, might, might lose those preferences and that um, uh, Will have implications, and in, um, um, and in particular also actually uh, also for the UK because these these countries uh, export a lot to the UK. So about ten percent of export in Bangladesh and uh, Cambodia uh, goes to the UK. And, and so we've also looked at sort of for example in the in the case of a No Deal Brexit it was in the past that uh, uh, um, the, the UK has published its uh, its its new uh, its new MFN tariffs. And actually, if you look at this, it, some of the Asian countries are the most, the, the, the ones who, who, who might, um, uh, might lose the most, um, the most, the most from that. Um, they always come up. Um, so that, that's an important issue. Um, the other, so we heard, heard about uh, China and the opportunities and challenges there. And I think that, that different countries are, uh, are, uh, have different opportunities depending on how well they are linked in, how well their, their policies and institutional frameworks are, uh, are developed. You see that also in the case of African countries, some really benefit from, uh, from Chinese investment, others uh, much less so. And that's also, uh, of course, the case in, um, in, in, in Asian countries. Where, and, and so the quality of, of engagement, the flexibility of their of, of approaches is, is really going to be an important, um, important factor. Digitalization, we haven't mentioned that yet, but I think it's, an, it's perhaps also an interesting issue to be thinking about in the case of Asia, um, because there's a huge industrial workforce in, uh, in, in, in many of the, so the, the LMICs, uh, low middle income countries that I mentioned, and um, that on the one hand, digitalization may help with, 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 with aging, uh, so new automation, automated production may need fewer people, but at the same time, it may also uh, uh, lead to some, some job losses over time, uh, at least in some, particularly in the industrial area, and, that, and um, in, in the industrial work, workforce. Um, so, for example, I've done some work, in, uh, do some work in Cambodia at the moment, 700,000 women working in the, in the, in the manufacturing um, uh, sector, uh, in the garment sector, and um, in perhaps 20 years' time, the, the, this country will have to have graduated out, may have graduated out of LDC preferences. It may have become richer. Other countries may have taken uh, the, the, the garment production. And also automation may have taken hold um, uh, in that sector a bit more as well. So 700,000 uh, women, uh, 20, 20 years now, now, in 20 years' time, they're 40. Well, there's a whole, a whole challenge there, I think, uh, uh, what's going to happen uh, there. And it's a, there's a political economy question there, who's, who's benefiting, who's gaining, and there are lots of uh, issues there to, to be uh, thinking about. And in, in, maybe in the top end, there's also a middle-income 
country trap, trap as well. So I've, got, I've just come from a meeting in, uh, in Ethiopia where, uh, organized by the, pri the Prime Minister's advisor who actually convened a whole range of, of, of actors from, from across the globe, from Latin America, from Asia. Uh, and there were some interesting presentations on, on, on Asia, for example, where um, uh, uh, Vietnam and Malaysia were once seen to be very, uh, very uh, good examples of how they build in industrial hubs, in especially economic zones and the like, and, and were, uh, were, were, were developing their manufacturing capabilities. But actually, they have, they're also coming to a middle income trap as well, and that, that some of the zones in Vietnam were more located for, uh, for political preference rather than where they should, be, should have been located. In the case of Malaysia, there's, they have also suffered from sort of the du dual economy, uh, the, the links between the foreign and the domestic. Uh, the capabilities haven't been made explicit, and much, and it needs to be much more attention to link, linking foreign firms with uh, with the local economy, and that's also lessons for maybe others uh, like uh, well the Cambodians of this world, but also I would say also in in, in Bangladesh as course as well. Of course, the, the domestic firms are there, but they m must also upgrade um, uh, uh, as well, and it's important to to be thinking about it. So then, two words on sort of the implications of that for. For donors, and I think that's um, uh, it's been highlighted already. But uh, in, uh, there are some maybe some traditional aid approaches. Uh, but uh, but even in the case of Afghanistan, for example, there you can also think about uh, linking it with with trade and investment as well. So the, the, if you think about telecommunications, um, is is actually a positive example of of uh, of how uh, firms can 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 uh, help to um, to transform. Uh, economy, so the telecommunications sector is actually one issue what, that has worked in uh, in um, in, uh, in Afghanistan, um, and then in the, then in the other countries, I think we talked we've talked about a lot about challenge of upgrading. Well, that's a key issue, and I think that's why we need to work with companies, with industrial parks, industrial zones, um, and thinking about um, about uh, improving the, um, the 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 conditions for uh, attracting investment and for making uh, investment work for also the local uh, capa uh, capability building as well, um, and so that that requires an, an investment driven approach, and there I think so there might be pockets of. Uh, of efficiency, there might be pockets of, of interesting opportunities there where you can work with, and it's, sometimes it could be UK companies, sometimes it could be other other companies, and I think you need to work around those those those, those, those areas and really think about a problem-driven approach uh, to, to to upgrading and uh, and economic uh, and, and, and economic, uh, economic development. And in that case, I would also say that sort of uh, uh, there is a UK interest as well, and uh, of course primarily de development-driven. But I think um, uh, sort of building markets approach upwards is, is really good. And finally, I would say that um, sort of on the regional integration area, I think that's also really important. Um, so particularly if we talk about sort of uh, uh, India uh, opportunities for uh, for Sri Lanka, we talked about how China may have impacts on different um, different uh, types of countries. Um, and if we look at, for example, that Cambodia actually exports uh, and other countries export most of its products outside the region. Um, so most of them goes to to UK, to Japan, uh, to the US, uh, to Germany, and so on, and uh, uh, but not to the region. I think that's that's a source of potential vulnerability. And if you have have more uh, deeper regional integration, uh, both trade and investment integration, uh, and also around f f providing the, the regional public goods, I think that will be really good for the, for the region to address vulnerabilities. And the the UK and other donors could also support um, support that regional integration um, uh, going forward as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dirk. Really rich set of issues there. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we'll come back to this, but I think the, um, this idea that the, some of these poorer countries will lose uh, preferential trade access, um, hopefully, because they have become middle income, so they're prepared. But I think that's one of the things we never know about growth, which is where the technological shocks might come from or other issues. And you mentioned the B word. <laughs> Brexit was going to come up. Um, but um, we're just going to leave that there for the moment and just open it up to the audience. I'm going to um, invite all of you to, um, to, to pose your questions to the panelists as well as to those of you who are um, online. Uh, please also submit your questions. I'm picking them up on the iPad here. Um, and if you could please say who you are, the organization that you're with. And if you keep your question brief, we'll try and get in everybody's questions within the next um, 20 minutes or so. Uh, so um, I will take uh, these, th these three questions, and then I'll do a second uh, round. So uh, this lady first, you had your hand up. Please introduce yourself, as I say, and your organization and your question. So our microphone is coming around. This is Women for Justice and Peace in Sri Lanka. Okay. Um, Who are you? Sorry, your name? 
Pune. Pune. Um, okay. Women for Justice and Peace in Sri Lanka. Okay. Um, Indrajit Kumar Sami has uh, just uh, said, uh, um, in effect, how successive governments in the last 70 years have been um, um, lucky to have the geopolitically strategic location um, to prosper uh, to some, at least to some extent. But uh, I want to fill up the story by saying how the North, this is about the South, but he said it's about the South. I want to tell about the North, uh, the heinous story of the North, at least in the last 10 years since the end of war, it has been highly militarized Within two months of the end of war, about 75% of the military was pushed into the north while all the people were compulsorily detained in camps, army guarded camps. And now the psychological operations of the population has been going on in the last 10 years. It is explicitly stated on army websites, psychological operations of the population. This is 21st century. Um, so there, uh, people, are, the, the army has grabbed all the uh, farms and other economic activities of the people, and the people are now working as farm hands for the army. And uh, so the, he, the army is giving donations, uh, presents to the school children. So having grabbed the livelihoods of the parents, they are giving uh, donations and presents to school children. You will have heaps of, on the, if you go to the army website, you will have heaps of pictures with the army brass uh, medals and with all the children, all the, with so many hundreds of schools. They are running 300, more than 300 preschools. Why is the army running preschools? And the UN Committee of the Rights of the Child last year said, about 15 months ago said, uh, the army must return all the schools to the department, education department, but still they are grabbing more and more preschools and running. And uh, this is anti-SDGs. So the whole world is engaged in SDGs, but the north of the people in the north of Sri Lanka are, are pushed or enforced, are put on anti-SDGs. Is okay. this acceptable, Indrajit Kumar Sami? Okay, thank you, Puni. Thank you. Um, and then I think you and then the lady in front. Yeah. Uh, I'm David Lawrence from the Trade Justice Movement. Um, I apologise that my question is Brexit related, but particularly in relation to how the UK's uh, post-Brexit trade policy might impact on developing countries. Um, Dirk mentioned preference erosion earlier. Obviously, one way that preferences can be eroded is if countries graduate and become middle-income countries. Another way is if um, th they could lose their preferences in, on the UK market if the UK enters into new trade agreements, um, the ones that the government have, has proposed with Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. And uh, yeah, I'm sort of interested probably particularly from Rachel in terms of what thinking the UK government's done about how those trade deals could erode preferences to developing countries. Thank you, uh, Sheila Page, ODI. Uh, actually, I want a point of clarification, which the first question also uh, relates to, and that's the vulnerability didn't seem to me to involve anything political. So I would like to know whether that was, because several of the countries that looked very invulnerable on your index to me would be quite vulnerable uh, politically. And in that connection, I didn't hear a mention of North Korea, which in a discussion of poverty in Asia would seem relevant. Uh, but my main question is actually on Ganesh's first assertion that Asia is a region. In what useful economic sense is it a region? It's problems of transition into and out of middle income are problems which are not exclusively Asian. And there are many countries which have reached them before. And I was astonished not to hear some com uh, cross-continental comparisons of that. Uh, and is it a region in terms of an economic unit? Is it sensible to think of it that way? Uh, Dirk just mentioned uh, Cambodia's exports, but I was struck when Indrajit said that Sri Lanka was poor at integrating into global value chains. It was one of the first countries to integrate into the textile and clothing value chains back in the 70s. It has been poor at keeping there, but when it did so, like Cambodia, it was to non-Asian countries. And is it not more useful to improve 
uh, in vulnerability by diversifying your exports and by not considering Asia as an economic region. Thank you. Uh, great set of questions. Um, I want to get in everybody, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to make the uh, panelists answer rather succinctly, so I'm going to apologize in advance that the answer is not going to be comprehensive. It'll be my fault. Um, so let me first go to uh, the governor, if you wouldn't mind addressing the, the first question in the north of Sri Lanka, and then also Sheila's question from the front about political vulnerabilities. Uh, briefly, thank you. Okay. Um, I, I suspect Puni may not have visited Sri Lanka recently, uh, because some of those perspectives, I'm not sure, are reflected on the ground today. I must say that I'm an ethnic Tamil. My roots are in Nalur Daphna. Um, now, the army presence in the north has been reduced. Uh, land has been returned, not all of it. It's a work in progress, but land has been uh, returned. And for several years now, the Northern Provincial Council, populated by Tamil parties, has run the northern province. Um, and infrastructure has been developed, the roads. Uh, the Indians are supporting the rehabilitation of the uh, Kanka Center Airport and the Palali Airport. So there's quite a lot happening. The story is not over. There's an office of missing persons that has been established. Um, so I'm not for a moment saying that uh, everything has been resolved. Uh, but I, I think uh, Puni's characterization of the situation uh, is somewhat outdated. Uh, quite a lot has happened. Uh, secondly, um, on on the political vulnerability uh, issue, um, I mean, uh, one thing I might actually widen it out, um, I, I think uh, Rachel, uh, in her very clear and, I think, uh, strategic presentation mentioned the risks. One needs to add global terrorism to that. As we have, um, have experienced um, vividly over the last... Uh, uh, eight, nine days, um, this is a threat that uh, um, is, is, can be sudden and, and dramatic. Uh, and it's an area where I think we need a strongly multilateral approach. Uh, Sri Lanka is fortunate in that many of its friends are, have, are now chipping into support. We're getting support from across the world in terms of technical support, in terms of investigation. Uh, in terms of the technologies required for this type of counter-terrorism operation. Um, so I think this is an area, again, which I think we need to build in, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the UK also is very well placed in terms of helping countries to gain the, the ca capability, the capacity uh, to combat this, this global threat uh, uh, in terms of, as I said, techniques, in terms of uh, technology, uh, in terms of equipment. Um, Finally, on, on Sheila's point, uh, it's true. Uh, Sri Lanka was one of the earliest uh, uh, countries to, to plug into global uh, uh, the apparel supply chains. But that was largely because of the um, multi-fiber agreement and the quotas. It wasn't a policy-induced thing. One of the reasons, what I was trying to say was the policy framework, which was largely anti-export, had an anti-export bias, did not create a propitious set of circumstances to plug into uh, uh, international production networks. In the case of apparel, at that time you had the multi-fiber agreement and quotas, that gave us the opportunity to get into these supply chains and we certainly were part of them and our apparel sector is now world-class and has done extremely well, even after the end of the multi-fiber agreement. Uh, but as I said, that was a bit of a one-off in the sense that it wasn't really policy induced. It was quotas. Outside that quota driven uh, uh, linkage into supply chains, we haven't done that well. So now we're trying to create the right policy framework so that we can access these uh, product, uh, international production network. Thank you, Governor. Um, Rachel, can I ask you to answer David's question on um, trade policy post Brexit? Yes, sure, sure. I mean, I think you know that we're absolutely committed to rolling over uh, trade preferences to all those countries that currently benefit uh, from a preferential trade agreement with the EU that we would roll over and ensure that the same preferential access is available 
um, in, a, in, in, in a post uh, Brexit uh, trade policy environment. You are specifically around how we will take account of development in the negotiation of new free, free trade agreements, if that is the position uh, we're in. We've been clear that development will remain uh, a central tenet of all our trade policy, and the uh, Department for International Development and the Department for International Trade are clearly uh, committed to understanding uh, the development implications of any future trade agreement, and we've been clear about that as well. Thank you. Uh, Ganeshan, can I just get you to quickly address why North Korea was uh, not one of the um, included? So I think that's uh, basically a data issue. You know, one is not sure <laughs> about uh, the quality of stats, uh, the coverage of stats, uh, the reliability. Um, I had um, a couple of American scholars one time who said, in North Korea, they pick a number, and, and that's the official number. So that's the basic reason. Um, if I may, I just add briefly on the political uh, issues in our index. Um, you're right, that's a really good point. Uh, we put in conflict as a number in the index. Uh, so we have the Afghanistans and so on there. Uh, but we should probably in future work try putting in some of the governance indicators, uh, you know, institutional development indicators. I think that may be useful. It'll change the rankings somewhat. Uh, and that's a really good point. Thank you. So I think it's fair to say it'll be Nepal, Afghanistan, and probably North Korea, which are remain low income. But we're not sure. OK. And then, Dirk, if I could just get you quickly to, uh, to address the Asia as an entity, uh, whether we should be looking at Asia as a region. Yeah. Could I also just briefly on the, on the other thing? I think the, um, uh, so I think so the index uh, uh, looks particularly at sort of the economic uh, vulnerabilities. But then the, the question is, how do you respond to those? And then, of course, uh, the, the politics plays a big role, that some countries are better placed. Uh, because of the politics than, 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 than other countries. Uh, and that was also the point that I tried to make about Malaysia, for example, is, is, is that uh, it has been uh, not very good at, at, at bringing up the sort of local capabilities alongside the, sort of the more foreign uh, entities in, in, in Penang, for example. And, and then you get sort of into the sort of the vulnerabilities in a, in a, different, uh, a different angle. I also say that Sri Lanka is also quite an interesting case of uh, thinking about its, its apparel or garments exports because it has an interesting firm that it's, it's called Helak, Helak Garments Firm, and it's, I think it's, it's UK owned, but it's, it's, its headquarters were in, um, in, uh, also in, 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 in Sri Lanka, and it's, it's actually now offshoring. Uh, it's gone to, um, to have some very interesting uh, subsidiaries in, uh, in, in Ati River. Uh, in Kenya and also in uh, Hawassa Industrial Park in, in Ethiopia, for example. So it's, it's then uh, it's going to other countries. And I think that's also interesting is, is managing this transition towards a higher, uh, 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 higher value added sectors, uh, industrial uh, sector, service sectors in Sri Lanka may also have implications for, for other countries. So that actually other countries can take the more, um, the more, um, uh, the lower uh, value added sectors first. And uh, as long as uh, Automation doesn't uh, doesn't uh, take hold. The other thing is also what in that links back to the trade agreements is that um, is that the Sri Lanka lost its GSP for some time, access and uh, and at that stage its exports were growing much less fast than other countries, its competitor countries. So there's also the issue around where the, even when you lose your trade preferences um, uh, or you get some preference erosion uh, for various reasons, whether there's political reasons in the case of C Cambodia perhaps or other reasons, you then, um, you then uh, lose, um, uh, uh, you lose some. And the regional, I mean, sub-regions I think is, is, is important. So in the case of Cambodia, I would say ASEAN uh, seems to be really important to push that more um, rather than, of course, the, the wider region. But I think that it seems to me like an important part to, to think much more on the deeper integration in, in, um, in, in that area. Thank you. Um, we've got some questions online. I encourage this. So I'm going to um, go to the three questions online. Then I'll come to a final round in, in this audience. So we'll try to keep these brief as well. Uh, this question, I think, we'll pose to the governor. It's come from uh, Francis Eckhart from DIMP. Um, regarding uh, actually Rachel's points on regional inter uh, cooperation, is Sri Lanka a member of ASEAN? Any thoughts, anecdotes on that organization? Governor, I'll pose that one to you. Uh, Sri, Sri Lanka is a, is a member of SAAS, the South Asia Association for Regional Cooperation. Uh, we're not a member of uh, ASEAN. Um, um, in the sense, as far as SAAC is concerned, it's um, one of the probably it is the least integrated uh, region in the world 
Uh, if you look at trade, if you look at investment, uh, so there's considerable upside that can be gained. But however, there are deep political issues uh, within the region. Um, and so instead, there is another organization, BIMSTAC, which uh, lo looks further east, uh, which has Myanmar and Thailand in it. Um, and uh, so that's another, another configuration. But um, as I said, um, whether one has a, a formalized uh, um, institutional arrangement which drives the process, or whether it's really commercial interests that drive the process, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, the, the facts on the ground are changing enough for businesses, really, now to see opportunities. There are Sri Lankan businesses, not just the garment sector, which has gone out not only to Ethiopia and Kenya, but also to Vietnam and Fiji. Um, uh, but uh, the, our, our banks uh, and financial institutions uh, have gone to uh, Bangladesh uh, and have gone to Myanmar. If I'm not mistaken, also um, Laos, uh, is it Laos or Cambodia, I'm not sure. But anyway, we're, we're seeing um, commercial, commercial um, imperatives now uh, driving um, investment uh, and trade flows. Uh, which are, are strengthening the integration uh, of the economies in the region. Uh, so, yeah, we are not part of ASEAN. Uh, we are in South Asia, and our region has not progressed anything like as much as um, some of the other regions. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Ganesh, and I'm going to pose this question to you. Um, it's uh, being asked by Anonymous. Um, <laughs> in terms of development aid, who will be the most important regional partners in Asia, given the evolving dynamics around the Belt and Road? Where are Ch Japan and the U.S.? Um, are they gaining, losing ground in terms of their investment and influence? So you have sort of Asia at one sense uh, being the new frontier because of its variegated development needs. And uh, China has sort of really uh, kicked off the starting gun in terms of the new wave of money that's coming um, through this Belt and Road. But as you, as you have seen from the Belt and Road event, um, some of it is very good, some of it has problems. And the weaker your capacity to manage this money, be it in terms of infrastructure ma master planning, uh, governance, plain old vanilla cost-benefit analysis, or even indeed your civil society institutions, you can be vulnerable uh, to this type of money. The question is more around um, the most important development partners. So will it be Japan, U.S., or um, China? Really? I think they're all important. Japan has been there a long time yeah. uh, in the region and is very present in ASEAN, um, very present in Sri Lanka. Um, I think there's a competition between the two, uh, different models. Uh, the U.S. Uh, has been somewhat absent in Asia. Um, USAID is there, but um, it's not as high profile uh, in many of the countries, partly because it has smaller amounts of money uh, in many countries. Um, so I think China and Japan are terribly important, along with the World Bank and the Asian Bank and others. Um, so that's the basic answer. Thank you. Um, uh, Rachel, I'm going to pose this question to you. It's coming from Chandra in Sri Lanka. It's often alleged that development aid or finance are often rerouted to donor countries in the form of consultancy fees, imports, etc. In this context, should recipient economies be encouraged to harness local expertise more? Isn't this how developing economies should be empowered? No, that, I mean, I think that's a, that's a great question. <laughs> and I think that um, I think they should. And I think that uh, from both building the capability of local markets to support uh, their own economies, I think it absolutely makes sense that local governments, local private sector are facilitated, supported to bring in relevant local expertise. Uh, I also think that sometimes there are pools of expertise, international pools of expertise, uh, including from the UK, um, <laughs> but not just from the private sector in the UK. I think what we see quite often is a growing demand uh, from developing countries, uh, including Asian countries particularly, to access public sector expertise from the UK. So those kind of peer-to-peer relationships, how do you do it 
here in the UK is often the question we most get asked mm. and where we get asked to support and facilitate those relationships. And in fact, uh, in Asia particularly, we've done a lot of work to support partnerships between uh, HMRC, uh, the revenue authority here and revenue authorities, for example, in, in Pakistan. So those kind of peer-to-peer -peer relationships are, are super important as well. Thank you. We've only got about five minutes left, um, so I'm going to gather um, the last round of questions from the room. I promised we'll get all of you in if you're very brief. So there's five of you asking questions. We'll start here, but I will ask you to be very brief because um, people will have to go on midday. So, and you as well, six questions. 30 sure. seconds each. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. Uh, my name's John Gibb. I used to work in development. Uh, I'm, I'm retired now. Okay, I'll keep it very brief. There seems to be an elephant in the room today, and that is standards of governance in Asia. And I don't know why this hasn't been raised. We've had a, a lot of emphasis on economic prospects, economic growth, uh, and the role for development. Um, but there's been a skating over the environment, and last week, of course, environment was quite high on the agenda in the UK. Also, countries like Myanmar uh, and the atrocity in Sri Lanka, not mentioned at all. I don't understand. Thank you. And then the question here. My name is Antoinette Salah. I'm an agricultural and um, in independent consultant. My question will be very brief. Uh, could investment in agriculture and the whole value chain improve the disparity between the rich and the poor and in inequality? Thank you. Thank you for the briefness. <laughs> she set a standard. Okay, there's four questions here. I'll be really, really quick. My name is Justin Darbyshire. I'm from HelpAge International. Just to one comment, just in terms of we spoke a lot about the demographic challenges, but nothing came through in terms of the responses or the output about the how governments or what the recommendations are in dealing with adapting to deal with population aging. Um, just a, a quick question. Did the report look at the National Transfer Accounts Project? and the work that's been done by the East West Centre. Thank you. Hi, uh, good morning, my name is Brendan Vickers. I lead the international trade policy team at the Commonwealth Secretariat. Uh, just two questions to Ganesh. Um, one is just a bit of crystal ball gazing. What are, what are the prospects for RCEP and the negotiations there? Uh, and the second is just to challenge you thinking beyond Asia. You know, um, What does Chinese slowing growth mean for countries that depend heavily on trade with China, particularly for Africa? Uh, if we look at the Commonwealth, for instance, over the last 16 years, the Commonwealth's trade with uh, of developing countries with China increased 8.1 times, but with the rest of the world only 1.1 times, so quite significant. Thank you. I'm very impressed by your quick questions. <laughs> Hi. Uh, don't know if you, I'll, I'll project, it doesn't matter. Uh, hi, uh, James Dinsdale, Department of International Trade. Uh, the panel's talked quite a little bit about regional integration, and there's been a little bit of discussion about what an Asian region looks like. Uh, I think a really important uh, like lever for regional integration has been CPTPP. Uh, the data's in, it looks pretty good. Uh, at the same time, quite a lot of the major trading partners in the region, not just China and India, but like Thailand, Taiwan, are missing from that agreement. What does the partnership think the future of CPTPP looks like? Hi, Tom Mills from Two Oceans Strategy. Um, we see the uh, ambition of large economic growth that's going to be driven by affordable energy. At the moment, a lot of that comes from burning coal. Do you see a tension between decarbonisation and climate change uh, policy and this economic growth? Thank you. Okay, there's a lot here. Um, we're not going to be able to address all these questions, but they're fantastically good questions. I think probably I'm going to go... Uh, I'm really sorry, I can't pick one up at this point, we're down to, no one's going to have a chance to answer any of them. Uh, so I'm just going to use this, um, I'm going to go around the panel actually and have you pick up um, a couple of points on each of them and obviously this is not the end of the conversation on this issue. So we'll start with the governor. Um, anything you want to pick up, a couple of minutes, um, just to pick up uh, any of the vast range of questions that came through. Um, whatever you can address. There were questions on governance, questions on agricultural investment to reduce inequality, um, a, a number of questions. RCEP, perhaps? Okay, I'll be very quick. Um, one, um, I should, for purpose of completeness, in response to Puni's first question, to say that one area where, we, where we, there's still a challenge is in terms of creating sustainable livelihoods in the north of Sri Lanka, and that, that's an area we need to work on. Let me uh, continue. Um, 
standards of governance in Asia, I mean, uh, well, corruption, you know, is, is an implicit tax on development. So clearly, uh, that's something that needs to be addressed. Uh, and and uh, and in terms of sustainability, uh, we need to find. And Sri Lanka is one of the most vulnerable countries. The World Bank has identified Sri Lanka as uh, one of the most vulnerable uh, countries to to climate risk. Um, so we need to find ways and means of mainstreaming uh, sustainability into our planning and budgeting processes. I mean that, that I think rather than having kind of ad hoc uh, approaches and often reactive uh, approaches, I think. We need to get uh, in front of the game and, and get that into our uh, budgeting and uh, planning and budgeting processes. Um, if there is a, a TPP Mark II, uh, I'm sure it would be in Sri Lanka's interest also to participate in it. This is a personal opinion. Uh, you know, <laughs> okay. uh, trade, trade agreements are not at the top of the central bank's agenda, but uh, uh, but I, I think that's something uh, which it would, could well be of interest uh, to... to, to uh, Sri Lanka. Let me stop with Thank that. You. Thank others. you so much. Ganesh, one minute. <laughs> so on our CEP, I think, um, you know, the prospects for um, East Asian countries uh, forming something with India will, will take some time uh, because there is a trade-off between service access and industrial tariffs, which is the big issue. Um, so I think, you know, we should have had a deal last year. It hasn't happened. Uh, it will take time. Um, I think it's convenient because it's of a lower base for developing countries. Um, so that's on that short answer. On um, the issue of uh, demographic challenges, uh, clearly women's employment is terribly important and participation rates uh, for women. Um, um, Anti-harassment uh, of women on transport is a big issue that one has seen across Asia, and I think we need to deal with that as a as really big issue. And then we've got to open up this sort of uh, vexed question of uh, you know, opening the labor market and free movement of labor uh, becomes important. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, one minute. Uh, thanks. I, I mean, of course, governance matters. The UK's partnership principles are absolutely uh, firmly in place and continue uh, to uh, apply as we work. We work in Asia. I think the institutions uh, that govern uh, economic policy clearly matter to us, uh, um, but also wider institutions and the governance of social policy as well, of course, uh, also matters to us. Uh, in terms of the question on uh, from Two Oceans uh, strategy, uh, absolutely uh, the future trajectory, and um, particularly uh, of cities, smart cities, low carbon cities, uh, zero carbon growth paths is something that we continue to talk to Asia about. And clearly, as we move into uh, uh, the trajectory to the new COP will remain uh, very high on the agenda. Um, it's going to be very high on the agenda at this year's UNGA, uh, the Climate Resilience Summit, but absolutely that's at the core of many of our policy interactions. One minute. Last yeah. word to you, Dirk. Yeah, no, sure. Um, I mean, I think uh, governance, of course, is an important uh, an important area, and I know that there are various donors also in the region, and we talked about a number of, of, uh, of donors, but we didn't talk about uh, uh, the, the funder for the, the, the project um, uh, that we engaged with on this Asia study, which was the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Australian, so we're also um, uh, very, very engaged. Um, I think the, um, uh, the point, last point on, on green, uh, green finance, green uh, sort of urban issues. I think that's also an, an issue where, for example, the UK also has a lot, has a lot to offer about green finance, or, or green, uh, uh, green mechanisms and so on. And I think that's, that's, that's something where donors can perhaps help and support uh, uh, Asian countries move, moving forward. Um, in terms of, it's a big issue in, uh, with the manufacturing sector in, in Asian countries, moving to uh, uh, an upgrade to digital, uh, more digital technologies, thinking about uh, digital parks, uh, um, and, uh, and, and and other areas, and that is a an, an interesting trajectory that also um, where, where you can work with, and there are also countries like the UK and others have uh, have a lot to offer in terms of digital uh, technologies, and I think that's also something we need to think about for the future. Is that we, think we want to see a different type of growth. We want to be more inclusive, and we want it to have be be more more uh, resilient, and we want it to be greener, and so uh, different um, different. Donors, agencies can work on this uh, in, in different areas, and, uh, and I think that's something for the also for the future. So I'd also hope that 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 even though there might be um, uh, um, 
uh, not all countries are that of the lowest income. There are still lots of poverty challenges. There, there are other types of global public goods challenges out there um, where, where donors can also um, en engage in the region in Asia. Thank you, Derek. I actually think that's a wonderful point to, to conclude on, which is actually there's no reason why development today shouldn't learn the lessons from development previously. There's no reason why it can't be climate friendly, why you can't have a better way of addressing aging societies, uh, global warming. There's no reason why it shouldn't be inclusive. We know the mistakes of the past. It's about doing it better this time around. And in fact, in some countries in Asia and other developing countries, they actually do better because they can leapfrog over the, the older systems that didn't work and move into the models and theories that do work. And so I think that's actually a wonderful note to end on. And then quickly on Antoinette, just to say the World Bank has very strongly proposed agricultural investment as a way of, in, of reducing inequality. The previous president, Jung, uh, Jim Kim, was very keen on that issue. So you've touched on that as well. And all of you have touched on great points. Um, and I know this conversation will continue. There are no easy answers to all of this. But thank you so much for being part of the conversation. And please join me in thanking this extraordinary panel who I thought were just superb and in um, really highlighting some of the things uh, that we all need to think about. Um, the governor there joining us from Sri Lanka, Dinashen, Rachel and Dirk, please join me in thanking these wonderful panelists. Thank you.